In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA 097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. You're drinking wine. I am. So am I. This is rose. Nice. Oh, you're in your classy children's cup again. <laughs> I literally was like, almost grabbed a red wine glass, and I was like, "How dare I?" And I grabbed a white wine glass, so I was drinking. I do have ice in it though, but it's hot. Wait, are you being serious? There's a difference between a white wine and a red wine glass. A thousand percent. My husband always pours them wrong. The white wine one is smaller. That's all. Really? Yeah. So what is this? That is a children's cup, a children's plastic cup from a restaurant called De Nada. That is not a wine glass in any way, shape, or form. If Blair hears this, she will appreciate this because <laughs> I bet you Blair has like twenty of these. Fine, and she also does not have wine glasses, so she has like four mugs, and that's it. And I'm like, oh my god, you own, you own a house, get dishes. But uh, who am I? So, so that, that the next time you're here, I'm going to take you to this place again, Donata. It is just like the most pleasant, fun, great vibey. Mexican restaurant and every margarita you order comes in one of these. And so when I've been there last time with friends, I ended up walking away with like six or seven of these things. And so I have plenty. And that's why nice. I drink my rose out of it now. I love it. Thank you. Good for you. Um, so welcome. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, welcome to Doing the Fail. I'm Fars, joined here by Taylor. We are doing a podcast, which is twice a week around topics that we want to discuss. Sometimes they're relevant to the topic of doom to fail sometimes they're not but this week has been a pretty big week for doom to fail news i think um there's three things that come to mind one is obviously trump's 34 felony convictions which is Indeed. insane insane the second is chad daybell who i covered forever ago getting the death mm-hmm. sentence i know happy and i feel like that just reminded me of a conversation where we're like I'm definitely anti-death penalty, but like in some cases, I'm like, "Fucking kill that guy! He's the worst!" And like that's what I feel about Chad Bell. Two children. Yes, like that man. I mean, and I also the same the same way. I also feel like yes, it'd probably be more more torturous for him to live out his life in prison. But like he doesn't have any remorse. He thought he was conning people for years, telling them he was like Jesus. Like fuck that guy. And then, do you know the, the third one is? Uh, no. So the third one isn't one that we've covered, but it is a fan favorite, um, sort of. Uh, oh, I know. Robert Picton died. Yeah, he got. Yes. Did you hear how he died? He got stabbed. He get shivved. So apparently, or something. Somebody broke a broom, and when they broke the broom, the very sharp part of it, they rammed up his nose into his. Broom. <gasps> is that nuts? whoa <laughs> was he he was in canada so he was never he was in death penalty he was just like life in prison right yeah they don't have death penalty there yeah whoa crazy deserved yeah <laughs> yeah well deserved well deserved. i mean nobody's nobody's feeling remorse for that no one's crying nobody's wow crying. um yeah i heard that that like hurt him that wasn't the thing that killed him or like he yeah, he died not not instantly oh yeah that's the crazy wild news this week that's wild. And we don't know. Did Lori, Lori Vallow hasn't been sentenced, has she? I think she was sentenced. I'm at, it's up, it's a, it's yeah, yeah. she got life life without Yeah. Ugh, which, like, the which, like, here's the thing. Doesn't she deserve it, too? It was her kids. She yeah. let this guy kill her kid. It's got to be easier and to kill. And her ex-husband. And she was definitely involved in the murder of the wife. It's going to be easier to kill somebody else's kids than your own kids. Wait. Uh, Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Anybody, anybody, if you have thoughts, please write to us. DoomToFellPod at (laughs) gmail.com. I was wondering which one's worse, him or Chad? uh, She's she's pretty bad. Yeah, they're both so bad. Trash. Trash humans doing trash. Deserve the worst. Um... Anyways, you said you have some news. Oh no, I just had a stupid story to tell you. Tell me. While I was while it was so dumb, but while I was waiting, or not waiting for you, I you were like, "Oh, I'll be a second. So I went to the restroom and then I looked down and there was something in my underwear, and I was like, "I'm dying. Like, what is this?" I thought I was dying, and it was like a un um 
dissolve Tide Pod. <laughs> that is, I can see that being terrifying. <laughs> to your like, credit, I can see that being terrifying. <laughs> That would so be just, terrifying. So I was actually. just laughing at myself. So I was like, what is coming out of me? What is happening? And um, it was that would be scary, iPod. though. That would be scary. <laughs> yeah, I listened to a podcast recently where, where the guest was a comedian, and all he would do was talk about how he has a tapeworm inside of him. And <laughs> and it was like, he was playing it off as though it was like a real thing. And mm-hmm. It would just come up every now and then. And the podcast ended after like three hours, and he pulls out like a fake snake and throws it at the host he's like wait this was all a bit you've been doing a bit for three hours about how you have a tapeworm and they pull out all... of his throat no he just pulled out of his butt <laughs> it's not even worse so things Gross. long story short tide pods are bad there could be worse things in there i didn't eat it it just was in my undies yeah 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 <laughs> Um, sweet. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, if I, if memory serves me correctly, you are the, you're the person today. I am. I'm going to kick us off. Kick us off. I wonder where in my 700,000 tabs do I have this? Taylor, I, by the way, if anybody's listening, so I just bought a new computer and I haven't bought a new computer in like eight years and I just bought a new one and it is so good. (laughs) Nice. What like, kind of computer did you get? It's a MacBook Pro. Nice. And first off, one thing I would say is that I got like the the bigger one. And mm-hmm. now that I have it, I'm like, ooh, this thing isn't that easy to actually have on your as a laptop. It's like a desktop. It's like a mm-hmm. pretty big mm-hmm. computer. But also, if you haven't used like a new laptop in the past couple of years, these things are like really good. It's really nice. I have mine. Well, I have mine from so my last job, they made me send it back, which was annoying because it was really old anyway. And then the job before that, they let me keep it. And that one died. And that was, I was pissed because it was relatively new. But the one from the job where we worked together, Florence has. It still works. Ma- I know. Apple, like, they nailed it. Like, they really, really nailed it. I love that. Yeah, I got a new Mac mm, maybe like a year and a half ago. Oh, no, I got it when we started doing this because I didn't want to do this on my work laptop. Yeah. And Nicole worked at the Apple store at that time, so I got her discount. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I get the same thing. I got a, I got a friends discount. No, I, I, I was doing this on my own MacBook, but the, my own MacBook was from 2018. And when mm-hmm. I would, when I would edit it, it, if I had to freeze it in a location on GarageBand to cut the parts together, I mean, just pausing it and cutting it and bringing them together would be like three minutes because the yeah. thing would just freeze. It was, just, it couldn't handle that much processing. I was like, I'm totally done doing this, and so. Um, also, before I get started, based on speaking of performance, we're going to get fiber internet tomorrow. That's huge. That's it's huge. It's huge. Then we're going to be able to record this uh, video I mean, all the time. I can do it while downloading something where it's it's so exciting. Um, so yeah, my life is going to change. Yeah, tomorrow. congrats. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You stepped in the right direction. I know. Things are looking up. We're also going to get solar panels, probably sign the contract tomorrow for them. So that'll be good too. Can I tell you to please listen to it's either stuff you should know or freakonomics episode about mm-hmm. solar say not to do it? Buy it yes why because the value the, the savings of it are only it, it, it was a long time ago let's do it but it was, it was something of the effect of like the more people that do it on the grid mm-hmm. that you're on the mm-hmm. less savings there are Mm-hmm. Because there's more of a surplus and it can't be stored, and so it just gets burned off anyways. And so, but I think yes, I totally get that. But also, I think it's going to save us like a thousand dollars a year, like not a ton, but like a little bit. But but because it, but, but but that's that not that's that that's in our own bill, not in the buyback. Because in like August, our bill is like eight hundred dollars right now because it's so hot. But then isn't your, wouldn't the installation, all that be like 30, 30, 40 grand? No, you just like lease it for like 350 a month. Okay. And that just pays your electric, I think. Okay. Please, let's find, when we're done, I'll find it and send it to you. Because okay. it was a story about somebody who did that exact same thing in California. And they were like, I'm screwed. And also I can't sell my house because this lease thing is attached to the solar panel and it's it, it turned into a whole thing and so anyways i'll send it to you i'll find it and after this one i'll send it to you okay 
I'm not saying with, I'm just like saying like just whatever other things you want to look at. That's all. Totally. No, I think we're gonna do it because it's so expensive, and I want to have the AC on all the time. Eight hundred dollars is a lot. I think the most I've had my bill come to is somewhere around four or four fifty. Yeah. Um. In the in the dead of summer. Yeah. This is so. And then we also like. Oh my god! I'm so sorry, everyone. We also like need new windows. You know, all those things that like contribute to it. You know, like I just the house is actually cooler because I in the living room I taped one of those metal emergency blankets to the windows. You know what I'm talking about? You get in like a first aid kit. Oh yeah. Put mirror because. <laughs> It's so hot in there because that's where the, that window has like the sun on it all day and it's getting to be like in the high 90s. So I covered it with those things and it's actually helping. It look, looks very trashy from the outside, but inside, I think it's working. My parents also installed a fan in their attic that apparently helped tremendously. I don't know. Oh, interesting. I'm sure they also we could get our ducts, ducts clean. Anyway. Anyways, uh, right. I know that people don't like to hear our banter, so we'll stop. Um, some, people, some people love it. Um, cool. Okay. Well, let's talk about let's talk about drugs. Want to talk about drugs with me? I have a drug story. Let's do drugs. It is a war about drugs, but not the Reagan Nancy kind. Reagan. Got it. Not hers, no. Um, there's an older one. Okay, I'm kind of making you guess. It's in China. Yeah, opium. About- opium. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the opium wars. There were two. I listened to a book called Imperial Twilight by Stephen R. Platt and two history hit episodes that I will link to in our show notes. Um, So the Opium Wars are right after the Enlightenment. So some of our friends from the Enlightenment will be in this story, but the actual wars itself are in the 1800s. The first one is from September 4th, 1839. August 29th, 1842. And the second one is from October 8th, 1856 to October 24th, 1860. And as far as I can tell, like not a lot of people died. It was just kind of like some battles and like taking over ports, things like that, but not like a ton of death, which is good in the long run. Well, yeah, it sounds like um, it wasn't about like people's ways of life. It was just this one drug. Yes. And it's also just about money, you know, mostly money. Mostly like control of things. Um, the British are really picking up their East India Company colonialism, all of that, like they've always done, but it's a lot in the East because of boats, because boats started to be really, um, you know, much better during this time than they've like ever been before. So the 1800s, if you're in China today as like a Chinese student, it will be taught to you as the century of humiliation. And it's something that um, contribute, contributes today still to. Chinese nationalism and it talks about how the communist party uses the century of humiliation as a way to talk about how China is better off without the rest of the world. So they learn about it in that way. Um, Obviously people have been trading with China for centuries across the Silk Road, which was like through China. You can picture that. I can My mind directly went to that onion website. Is it like a fake onion, like a fake website. Sorry, it, it's like tour. It's like it was like a tour. Oh, uh, sure, like sure, sure. Silk Road, and you could buy. All well, exactly of- that. Yeah. That's what the Silk Road was. Yes, it was like you know, go through China, get their get their shit. But it was hard because you have to cross China over land, and it's huge. And also, there was always going to be missionaries trying to get into China, trying to get people to become Christian, of course, because they fucking love doing that for some reason. And today, two percent of China is Christian. Um. So they didn't do that great of a job. I will say there's one thing that when it comes to conversions that I agree with 100%. It's the way the Jews do it. Like nobody in Judaism is like going around saying, we need you to be Jewish. It's like, no, you have to come to us and really want to like go through it. Whereas like, yeah. why are you going around trying to force people to be? I mean, Islam does the same thing, I guess. Like, they go around trying to force people to be, the, well, probably less than Christian. They do Whatever. it less. Christians do it, I feel like, the most. Well, that... Islam did it, or Muslims did it through the sword of, like, convert or die, which is, like, yeah, probably worse. Yeah, and I feel like, I guess, I think, I, well, I'm missing, obviously, that, like, true believer part of me, where, like, if maybe if I really believe, far is that, like, you were going to burn in eternal damnation forever, I would want to try to save you. Because you're my friend and I care about you, and I don't want you to burn for eternity. But I don't think that, but I don't believe that. So I don't have that in me. I'm not afraid of that for you. You know? Also, isn't that the old saying of like, would you rather go to hell? All the cool people were in hell. Yeah, 100%. Nothing's done. 
but Sorry, anyway, I, I totally neither I, exist. I, I so um, there is a story of one missionary who like walked all the way through China um, and he like got to Tibet and he met the Dalai Lama. Um, the Dalai Lama at the time was like a four year old and he's had all these fun stories, but like they've been trying to do that forever. Um, but there are going to be obviously some barriers. So now it's like the late 1700s, like during the enlightenment time, there are bigger boats. So they're able to get there via boat to start trading with China. It's still a long, long way. So even like during the opium wars, it still takes like, a year to get a letter to to England, you know, which seems so hard to fight a war when you can't communicate with anyone, you know, like you have your own people on your ship, but you can't talk to the people in charge. There's years between communication and then so much changes between them too. I don't know. It sounds impossible. Um, so China isn't closed to trade. So I think we have this idea that China is like this totally locked down country. Like they were trading with people for centuries, but it's very, very like limited and they control a lot of it. So there's a big, the biggest port is in Canton and they let like British and French and Portuguese uh, merchants come to Canton for a part of the year to conduct trade. Um, they don't allow women or families because they don't want people to start to grow roots in China. They want them just to come to trade and that's it. So the women and children have to live on Macau, which is owned by by Portugal. So it's hard to like, you can't stay there and you can also cannot learn the language. It's illegal for a Chinese person during this time to teach someone how to speak Chinese. So they want to keep that like in their own stuff. Citizen. So they've always wanted to do population control. Yeah. Yeah. That, and it, it's population control and like idea control. You know, like they don't want like a, a bunch of like British guys to come in and like start their own town and start like talking to people, you know? Yeah, makes sense. They don't want them to be able to communicate with like the average Chinese person. And they're not able to um, because a lot of people don't, look, nobody really speaks Chinese, none of the British or the French, and they're not allowed to learn. So that's where we get like this. I thought this was interesting, like that, like, there's some things that are like a stereotypical. If you imagine someone pretending to be Chinese, they say some, they talk in like a, a racist, like cadence, you know what I mean? But a lot of that is because the Chinese merchants were only allowed to say a couple words in English uh, and vice uh, versa, uh. you know? So like what the one that I remember from the book is like the phrase chop chop, like that comes from the, British and the English trying to talk to each other and trying to make people go faster, you know, but they like aren't allowed to like really learn each other's languages. So they cannot really communicate. That is fascinating. And that's on purpose. So a couple people do learn how to speak Chinese. One of the first, I mean, and of course there, I'm sure there are outliers, of course, but one of the first people from Britain is a, a little boy named James Flint. Um, he kind of gets dropped off when he's younger to go learn to speak the language. And he learns Cantonese, but then quickly learns that like, oh, a big part of China speaks Mandarin. So he can't even communicate with them. So he learns a little bit of it. And um, he ends up, he always kind of resents it because his dad just kind of like put him on this boat and made him go learn Chinese. And he'll go back and forth to China his whole life. And he'll start working for the East India Company. So a lot of people in the story work for the East India Company um, doing trade with them. And I don't know if I'm going to mention James Flint again, but he did go back to Europe in the 1770s and he ended up teaching Ben Franklin how to make tofu which is super fun weird weird right but fun so, is that his contribution to society is I like love the idea of Benjamin Franklin discovering tofu like being like this is incredible I don't know what to do and, and now I can only like, picture him as um Michael Douglas from the show so I'm uh, like yeah. it's just like it would be great it'd be a delight he would love it um, so another person involved in learning Chinese and trading is a man named George Thomas Staunton. He's also going to work for the East India Company. Um, I'm only mentioning him. He's like a big background in the story. One of the people who was really trying to get others to learn um, Chinese. He would get to China via Tenerife. He he sold he sailed from to Tenerife to Rio and then down to China. So takes a while to get there, but he's, he did that. He's in and out of the story. Um, the first person to write in Chinese English dictionary was named Herbert Allen Giles. And it was like hundreds of pages because obviously China, Chinese is like a really complicated language that has hundreds of characters. So he was the first person to try to like write it down. Cause before then people that kind of didn't think that it could be translated, you know, but we all have like the same thoughts and ideas, right? 
you all have the same like they're I not guess. saying something yeah. in Chinese that's impossible to say in English. Yeah, I for guess. The most part. I guess. I, I, I have noticed that like I when I think in Farsi it is a little bit different than when I think in English because the language is different. So like the layers and the emotions that are associated with it are different, I guess. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyways. No, cool. it's interesting. Cool. Um, so that's kind of that's the prelude to, to what's happening. Um the East India Company is always there i'm trying to like expand trade in that area obviously in india just in the whole south asia asia area there's other cool things that happened before the opium wars there are chinese pirates there are people who are like outside of is it it's a chinese imperial government and this is actually going to be like the end of the empire for um for the Qing chang dynasty oh my god I'm, i messed it up and i wrote it down the Qing dynasty it's print it's spelled q i n g but pronounced Ching. Q U I Q U I G. Q I N G. Q I N G. Okay. But pronounced Ching. And do you remember when the internet first started and there were those videos of that guy <laughs> pronouncing things incorrectly? No. No, I don't remember the day the internet started, Taylor. I don't know what you were doing that day, but so I feel like one of the first things playing on outside was like a guy like pronouncing words wrong, like hyperbole. He'd be like hyperbibidu boo. You know, like it was funny, but now I can't. Now I feel like whenever I go find a trend, a pronunciation thing, I'm like, not sure if it's real or not. But this is the story is gonna be the end of the Qing dynasty, is my point. Um, there's some folks who ne never want to be a part of Chinese society and they always live on the water. And there are these like Chinese pirates who go around ports. And there's a really cool story of a woman named Shi Yang, who was a lady pirate, who at one point commands like 70,000 people on like all these ships. And they like never, ever stop on land. And they're just always um, trading back and forth on their ships. But they actually get um, folded into Chinese society, all of them. So we're going to give them amnesty and like let them live on land. So there's like uprisings happening in China. Also, by the, by the way, during this whole entire time, you know, Britain's fighting the Revolutionary War with the United States. It's fighting the Napoleonic Wars. Like there's all sorts of stuff going on, which... You know, if you want to be a world empire, I guess you're going to have to fight like a ton of wars at the same time. And that's what Britain has going on. Um, there is a rebellion in, eight, in at, at the very end of the 18th century called the White Lotus Rebellion, where a religious sect thought that Buddha was going to be returning. So they wanted to take over the empire. Um, a lot of people died in that one. It took eight years to crush that rebellion. Some of them, you know, got into the imperial palace, tried to kill the emperor. There's all sorts of stuff happening with that. So that rebellion was like fresh in people's minds. And in 1811, there was a comet that freaked everybody out. So like people are kind of on edge because of all of the trading and people are trying to get into China and China's having its own rebellions and sort of an inevitable, you know, globalization is going to inevitably get into Chinese culture. And this is the beginning of it, like yeah. for real. I wonder where the whole like a comet is the symbol of things changing started. Because with yeah, the hell bump, you know, like they, mm -hmm. they all killed themselves and I know. I do think it'd be fun to not know what an eclipse was and like be there be around during an eclipse and just be like, what the fuck is going on? It's so scary. <laughs> like, oh my god. Like that, and then like if someone was inside, they would never believe you. Just so fun. <laughs> um, but so all that's happening. China is huge, but it does have an has a small navy. But their boats are nothing like the English boats. Like they they cannot compete with them in in maritime battle. Um, during the uh, Qing Dynasty, the emperor is Emperor Duo Guang at this point, and it's definitely within the imperial palace and the emperor's circle. It's a culture of like they don't tell him what to do and they don't really make suggestions it's sort of like a yes sir we agree with you so even when people start to have good ideas and like have their own ideas of where the government should do they don't tell the emperor they'll be like oh hey i saw this letter that my friend wrote and like it's dumb do you want to read it anyway and then like he would read it and the emperor would be like i kind of like it he'd be like oh really okay well i thought some parts weren't dumb you know what i mean just like you wouldn't get your head chopped off right you would like be like oh this is an idea that it's off so um, that's what's happening in, in China. And on the English side, it's Queen Victoria. She, it's the Victorian era um, in England. And the East India Company, again, has been trading with China for a long time. And legally, the things that they are trading are spices, silks, and tea. Do you drink a lot of tea? 
No, it's a cultural thing. Um, it's an Iranian thing. So every Iranian I know has tea every morning, afternoon, and evening. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually a drawer in my house, which is my mom's like, just never go in this drawer. And it's just all of her tea stuff. Aww, <laughs> so when they visit, cute. they can have their tea. But I, I never, I never got into it. That's amazing. So tea, people have been drinking tea for thousands of years as well. But it came over to like England and the, in the Europe area in like the 1600s. And they started to like it because people were before that they were drinking like, you know, beer all the time and like gross water. So they're trying to figure out and coffee and something else so they can drink. And all of a sudden they can't fucking live without it. You know, and it starts to get more and more expensive. So besides herbal teas, all other tea is made from the same plant, um, the Camellia sinensis. Did you know that? No. So green tea, black tea, white tea, oolong tea, and then another one called puria tea. It's all made from the same plant. The green tea, they take the leaves off when they're green and they quickly oxidize them by like steaming them or, or pan frying them. Um, well, that's to stop them from oxidizing. Uh, and those are the leaves that you use for green tea and for matcha. They they dry them and then grind them. And then black tea is it's fully oxidized, oxidized, which means they like let it dry in a certain way, um, which makes it really dark. And then white tea has like minimal processing. Oolong is a more more oxidized. So it's all the same plant that gets tea, and that plant is like really easy to grow in in Asia, and that's why a lot of tea comes from there. That's where it started there. You don't drink tea, do you? Um, I like sometimes at night I'll have a little bit of tea, but like it kind of makes me it gives me a headache. Like I I, I, I will I take um, a vitamin. There's moments when I like if I get sick and I'm trying to do the herbal thing, I'll mm-hmm. have some tea, and yeah. it feels like I'm doing something, even though I'm probably not. But that's the only time I. Yeah, I'm not a tea yeah. guy. No, nah, coffee guy. I like coffee. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so that's what England wants. England wants the tea mostly. And you know, you'll remember there was like all the stuff in the US around like tea being taxed because we wanted the tea also, but all the tea is coming from China. Whether it's coming from China from Britain to America, like it's it's all coming from China. And China doesn't need a lot of stuff. Like China is huge and it has most of the stuff that it needs. Anything that's gonna trade with other countries for is kind of like a nice to have. Like it doesn't need anything. They doesn't need it doesn't need the UK as much as the UK needs China. All of a sudden, there's something that China needs, and that thing is opium. So, do you know where opium comes from? Uh, probably Afghanistan. Uh, it could probably grow in Afghanistan. Um, no, I mean like where does it derive from? Like, where's it made from? Oh, it's a poppy plant. It's a poppy. Do you know how it is made? So they take the um the middle part of it, whatever that's called, out, and then they cut it, and then it seeps out, dries, mm-hmm. and they scrape the dried bits off or something, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So oh, they wow. take like the the pot. It's almost like I'm a I'm an opium manufacturer. Weird. So I don't. I mean, this is another one of those things. You're like, how the fuck did you figure that out? But you take like the op- the poppy pod that is like the size of like a tennis ball and they slice it with a knife and then the it oozes out while the seeds inside are still white so not like the black seeds that you put on a bagel like the white ones while they're still white and then it has a sap and they scrape the sap off and that sap is the opium they like do some other things to it and like that's that's it so i feel like someone like accidentally cut a poppy pod and then licked it and was like holy shit like that's how we got here yeah there, we could probably do 50 episodes on how do we find this out yeah discoveries so the poppies are you're right in warm climates um but for our story the poppies that are part of the opium wars are grown in india so they're not grown in china they're grown in india India and brought over to china so yeah this is how you make it you get morphine codeine heroin all come from the same um the same thing laudanum which is like a very victorian thing i feel like in victorian movies they're always like taking a dropper of laudanum yeah, the Winchester like house. That's like I was doing. Remember that? Oh movie? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that is that is opium mixed with ethanol, alcohol, and like maybe a little bit of flavor, <laughs> but it's like rough. But it's gonna make you feel super high. You're gonna pass out. Um, obviously, it's one of those things that was like used as like a prescription drug for. A, not, I mean, 
yes, obviously opiates, but also like the Victorian era. Um, it was one of the things that it was used for was a cough suppressant, but really it just like made you pass out so you won't cough anymore. It works. It's effective. You're like, oh, what works. So China is people are starting to get addicted to opium in China because the British are bringing so much in. And another thing that China wants besides the opium that like illegally wants, but it doesn't have a lot, a lot that it wants from the UK, but it does want silver. So China is in like a two metal system right now where like most people, they have copper coins and then there's silver coins that the, like the rich, more rich people have and people like want silver. That's like the big thing there. So this will destroy the economy in like a very classic economic way. Well, they will get all of the silver. Like most of the silver in the world will end up in China during this time. And that will like tank the value of silver and that will wreak havoc on, on the economy. The British are in this loop where they are like, until they ban the transatlantic slave trade, which they will like in the 1800s, but before that, they are enslaving people, bringing them to South America, also enslaving South Americans there to dig up silver, to bring to China, to give to the Chinese to get their stuff. So it's like a whole worldwide chain that they have going on. And a lot of it is based on silver as like a metal. There's that having the silver and the opium's coming in. It is illegal, and but people are using it more and more as it gets cheaper and as there's a lot more of it coming in. The people who are going to get rich are these like British and American middlemen. There's a company uh, started by two men called Jardine Matheson. It was started as an opium trader in 1832. Today, it is one of the top 200 publicly traded companies in the world and has over 400,000 employees. It's officially called a... A holdings Limited is a it's a Hong Kong based Bermuda domiciled British multinational conglomerate. I have it's a very business 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 place and it still exists today. What does it do today? I have no idea. That's what it says. It's a British multinational conglomerate. I don't. I, I couldn't figure it out. Weird. It, it's just like the whole they like own a lot of stuff and like trade a bit. I'm sure someone knows, but I couldn't figure it out really. So like that company still exists. They got their money from the. Uh, illegal opium trade. Another person who will be there getting making his fortune is Warren Delano, who's FDR's grandpa. He makes his money from opium. And another man named Francis Blackwell Forbes. He's not the Forbes of like the magazine, but he is John Kerry's great great grandpa. So a lot of like American dynasties come out of this. So it just kind of goes to not- show that like the chips are kind of stacked against you. Like yeah. <laughs> it's like, like it's should- like like if you weren't selling opium to China in the 1800s, you know, yeah, I don't know. Like, sorry, my grandparents weren't doing this, and now we're here. Yeah, you know, instead of being a Roosevelt. Um, yeah, totally. And they're not bringing in like a little bit of opium; they're bringing in hundreds of thousands of crates of opium. And so the emperor uh, Zhao Guang is trying to figure out what to do. Some people are like, "You should legalize it," you know, which is like a very common thing that people think when there's a drug problem you should legalize it so you can tax it so you can monitor it you know all of the things that that we know and but nobody will really say that so they're trying to like suggest it to the emperor but like they kind of like teeter back and forth on it and they they several times they officially make it illegal but you know the fact that they had to keep doing it means that no one was right listening you know so people don't really care they just want it um there's a governor general governor general lynn zexu is in charge of figuring out what to do next. He's one of the top top people in the government. So he writes an open letter to Queen Victoria and he's like, hey, can you stop this? Can you stop this opium coming into my country and hurting the people here? But she never gets it, but it does go to the London Times and it goes in the paper. So like, I'm sure she saw it or whatever. He also does a thing where he's like, everybody has to stop doing this drug right now. So he brings opium opium addicts into groups of like 10. And he's like, stop doing opium right now. If one of you does it, I'm going to kill all of you. So they created, that was a pretty good incentive for people never to do it again. So they created like little communities of people not doing opium because if one person did it, they would all die. So I like try to stop people from doing it. If it was me in that group, I would just do the opium immediately because I'm like, one of these other addicts is going to do it. And then I'm going to get killed for it, so might as well be high when it happens. That's what I feel like the prisoner's dilemma is. Like, just do the opium. <laughs> just do the opium. But they're trying to do that. One big thing that happens to start the first opium war 
is uh, Lin Sexu. He seizes the fort in Canton that a lot of these like American and British traders are at. Delano is there. It sounds kind of hilarious because it's actually it's a bunch of like rich white guys without their servants. So they like the Chinese servants aren't there. So these guys have to like figure out how to cook, you know. So like Warren Delano figures figures out how to make like a rice pudding from a cookbook. But other than that, they're like burning their food. They don't know how to make their beds. They don't know how to like get their clothes ready. They have never taken care of themselves before. So now they're in the siege, but they have plenty of stuff. They're not being starved out, but they can't leave and they can't trade and they're stuck in this fort. That's one thing that's happening. And while they're there, there's this dude, and this is kind of this dude's fault. His name is Charles Elliott. He was in charge of regulating the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade when they stopped it. So Britain banned it way before the, the United States did. So he was someone in South America trying to stop like all the residual effects of that happening. And then his next job was to stop, to figure out the opium situation. And they just like sent him to China to do this. And he was like way over his head. He didn't know what to do. And so he's in this siege and there's all these traders and they have all this opium and they're like pissed that they can't move it. They're pissed that they're stuck there. There's no women, you know, all the things. And then... Charles Elliott is like, okay, I have an idea. He's like, for all the opium chests that you give me, and each chest is like, you know, so many pounds of opium, the British, uh, the British monarchy will pay you what they're worth right now, later. So just give it to me and we'll pay you later. And everybody's like, that deal's great. Like, I don't have to sell it anymore. Like, you'll just buy it for me right now. Yeah. You know? So hold on. So he just created like, a distribution network. He's not going to distribute it. He's going to get it destroyed. So he's like, we're going to stop this because the Chinese don't want us to have opium in there anymore. But the problem is all these traders have all this opium that they want to bring into China and they're going to lose a shit ton of money because they've been counting on this, bringing it in. So why don't I just pay them all for it? We'll destroy the opium and then it'll be over. No more opium. No opium in China. They have their money. Chinese doesn't have opium. Everyone's happy. Except the addicts. Well, except the addicts, sure, but mostly it's the British monarchy who's like, we're not going to fucking pay for that. Are you on drugs? Right, right, right. Yeah. Like, are you on opium, Charles Elliott? So by the time that that news gets back to Britain, it got back because the traders came back and they're like, hey, give us our money. And they were like, no. Like, he had no authority to do that. You shouldn't have done that. And the way they got rid of it is they, like, burned it in, like, a very special pit and then, like, sunk it in the ocean. Like, they got rid of it. So, um... Then there's like a little bit of back and forth between the British um, like merchants and Charles Elliott and the Chinese government where they're like, someone has to pay for this. And so the first opium war is essentially trying to get China to pay for all the opium that was destroyed. And they're blaming it on them because they had had all the people under siege in the fort in Canton, even though Charles Elliott is the one who really got it all destroyed and made that promise that they couldn't keep. Right. Also, Two drunk guys, two drunk British guys kill a Chinese man and Elliot won't surrender them to the imperial government. And that also is a problem. So that's going to start the first war. Some people, so the UK, the British come with all of their fleets and they want the money back from China for the opium that was destroyed. So they start to attack like villages along the coast. In some cases, villagers who have always lived on the coast of the sea, coast of these rivers in the middle of China, they make them leave their villages. Like the Chinese government is like, leave your village. So there's nothing to pillage. And they make them leave and they have to leave for like 50 years before they can go back, which is super sad. And it ends up with, after like four years of war, it ends up with the Treaty of Nanking. So Nanking, also called Nanjing, you know, we that was a big thing in World War II as well, like prelude to World War II when the Japanese came in and they attacked, attacked Nanjing. And that's because it is very important. It's on a very important tributary that leads to the Yangtze River, which leads to most of China. So that city is always getting sacked, like throughout I think, history. I think that was part of my story about that forbidden city. The yeah, most probably. densely packed. Yeah, somebody mm -hmm. with the Japanese taking it over and then anyways. Yeah. Yeah. It's all interconnected. Because it's like a place where it's it's all yeah, it's all in that area and it's like a really important city. Um so the Treaty of Nanking sucks for the for Ch for China. They owe all the money back to Britain. The British are no longer under Chinese law, so they can do whatever they want to do. They lose Hong Kong to the British and they won't Hong Kong will be yes. British until nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. This was this yeah. was a story. 
Yeah. Yeah. And all the ports need to be open to, or at least like, I think it's like 10 more ports need to be open to the British and they can like bring their families and stuff. So China gets the shit end of this treaty. 10 years later, the second war starts with the seizing of the ship, the Arrow. So it's a British ship that gets seized by, by Chinese, um, like fighters trying to like protect their ports. It's a very like, remember the main thing. Like some people will call it the Arrow War because people are so mad that the ship got got seized and other people joined this time france france russia the united states um the united states comes but they're like kind of hanging out to see who wins they don't like really help either side and when it's over um they will go to the chinese like emperor and they will bring instead of like goods because you know that's not what china wants or like sympathy or like whatever they bring plans to build better boats so they bring like the logistics to make a better military to China as like a peace offering, which will help China's military grow. I mean, so, in hindsight, probably not the best thing to do, but <laughs> which we continue to do. So, um, so there isn't like in everything I read, like the actual wars itself, it's just like little fightings. Cities are being little cities on the on the coast are being destroyed. Um, they're destroying boats and goods. Not a ton of people died, but they are trying to like prove their might to the Chinese. And they're doing that because the British Navy is always going to, you know, at this time, beat the Chinese Navy. There's going to, there's like, they've been fighting all over the world. They've learned a shit ton in the Napoleonic Wars. You know, they've been all over. So there's a lot that they can do. Um, one thing that they do that is uh, a real bummer is that he, the British sack, this is kind of the end of the Second Opium War. They sack the Old Summer Palace and the Forbidden City. So, like, the two big places where the emperor's family would live get destroyed by the British. They do things like steal all the stuff. You know, there's, like, British guys, like, wearing, the, like, holding, like, all these pots and, like, wearing all these silks and just, like, taking everything from these places. And it reminded me of um, in Dan Carlin's Genghis Khan series he talks about when the mongols um come and sack parts of china and the mongols will wear these like beautiful chinese silks until they rot off their bodies they just like steal them and like never shower and never do anything so just like wear them forever um so a lot of this again is going to be destroyed during this war another guy that is there of course is lord elgin's son do you know the, the elgin marbles you know what those are no they're in the British Museum, of course, but they're from Greece and they belong to Greece. And Lord Elgin stole them and brought them to the UK. And it's something they're still in the British Museum. But I know like George Clooney's wife was a lawyer trying to get them to go back to Greece. Like they don't belong to the UK. They're in the British Museum. Another what one. Is of it, what things. is it? Art? Uh, no, they're there. It's a marble. It's a um, what's it called? Like the top of a building. All of the marble statues that are kind of like half in, half out of the wall. Okay. So, like, if you're thinking, if you think of like the crop, it's not there from the crop. Whoops, I don't know. It might be, but the Acropolis pillars, and then it has like the kind of half triangle at the top, full full of uh, sculptures. So that's what Belgium all. Oh, are. oh, okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking um, at them. So his son is going to be there sacking these, um, the Summer Palace and the Forbidden City, and so they also steal these. Pekingese dogs, these like Chinese dogs, and they give one to Queen Victoria, and Aww. she names it Ludi because it's loot from looting these palaces, and she loves it so much it's like in paintings. Like what the fuck? Um, I love all dogs, but those are particularly ugly dogs. She named it Ludi to remind her that they looted the Chinese Imperial Palace to get it. I mean, it's not great. <laughs> I think that's a wild. I wrote, "What the fuck, Vicky." Like, that's crazy. Um, so after this is over, there will be a couple more treaties. And the Chinese will lose parts of Manchuria to Russia. They'll lose more of the south part of China. Um, and they will lose, like, 10 more ports. Like, they will, it'll, it's not good for them. This is part of their, you know, century of humiliation. And the last emperor of the Qing dynasty will be Tong, And he'll reign until 1912. And after that is the Chinese Revolution. And then China becomes a republic. So this is really, like, the end of imperial China. Um, and a lot of it is happening because of, like, the inevitable globalization of China because of like boats and communication and, and all those things and trade and, and Britain's like desire to own the world. And um, that will contribute to it. And just not being able to like keep up with the changes and trying to keep your people 
really secluded and that's what they were trying to do and like that didn't work and now they're trying to like you know then, then there was a revolution which i don't know a ton about but then it sounds like you know today in china you know they're obviously trying to keep people from knowing about the rest of the world in different ways um trying to go back to that idea where like we are we are our own enclosed people we don't need anyone else It's so crazy because in it just it's just so antithetical to human nature to try to keep someone from reality. Yeah. Like whether that's like a society in the government or parents and kids, it's just like reality is gonna come crashing into you one way or another. Yeah, at some point you're gonna like see other people. It's really really wild. Because if you think about it, like the people in China and the people in like North Korea and then Mm -hmm. everybody else are living in a totally different world. It's crazy. Like I can't I've seen a couple of documentaries where they show you like a little bit of North Korea, you know, but like they just don't know what the rest of the world is like. Like you wouldn't know a thousand years ago, you know, like sometimes Yeah, I even think about those like documentaries, they don't show you the people exactly. that live there. They only show you, like, the government-sanctioned tours. And you just have to infer what that life must be like. But, like, that's what I'm curious about. Like, what's the person's life like that's, like, living there? It's got to be crazy. Right. Yeah, it's so it's so it's so interesting. I don't know. And like I always think about like, those tunnels that they have. Like everybody in North Korea could go underground probably in like a minute. Because either for like nuclear war or for like other things. Is that is that I've real? heard that. I think so. Like, a lot of it could be underground. Like, it's just, like, it's wild. And, I, like, you know, a thousand years ago, sure, you didn't know anything that was happening around the world, but now you can. And, I don't know, for better or worse, I guess. <laughs> Taylor, am I'm I a cr- over. I'm overwhelmed, but it seems fine. am I crazy for being like? I mean, realistically, in our lifetime, it probably won't matter. But I do think that China is like. probably like the u.s is probably on its way out in terms of being kind of like a global superpower and that china's probably the next up on the ladder i mean Yeah, I read a great book about um, it was about data and like looking at the history of the world. And a lot of it was like, you know, the economy in China is moving up. So like things like super cheap labor, not that it doesn't still happen in China, obviously, but it's like moving to Africa. And like it's actually how that like is good for Africa because that's their next step in like their economic revolution. But then like. You know, who gets it after that to be able to, like, move up and do, like, the next thing? Um, I don't know. But I agree that America's on the way out. Like, we're not. Like There's the fact no forever. that like all these things that are like high tech patents that are just like handed over to China and they're, I mean, it, the old saying of like, you can see further when you are on the uh, shoulders of giants, you know, Yeah, like, yeah. but imagine if like you get all the shoulders all at once without any of your own actual R and D and investment. And it's like, God, you can go so much further. <laughs> it, Yeah. it feels like. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. I don't know. It's been a wild Weird. time. But yeah, but this is but I but I was I'm I was excited to learn a little bit about this cuz I just don't know a lot about Chinese history for many reasons, but this was interesting to read about. Yeah. Yeah. That that is one of the one of the places I internationally that I do want to visit China. It does seem interesting. I don't Um know. My husband was there. Juan was there many years ago when we first were dating, and he was like, every single thing I did, I was like, Taylor would hate this. like what? <laughs> we'll see. Just like, I feel like I don't, um, like, I just don't love, like, well, I don't love, like, really traditional Chinese food, which is, like, fine. No, you can't love everything. I like fake American Chinese food, you know? But if I go to, like, a really authentic dim sum restaurant, I don't like it. It's not for me. Yeah. When um right before the lockdowns happened and when I left our last company that we worked together at, um I went and visited the Schmidt in San Francisco. And they took me to a very authentic, like, Cantonese restaurant. And, um, uh, yeah, that's just not Mm -hmm. flavors Mm -hmm. that are, I'm, I'm used to. and that's fine you know also because like when i was in japan like morgan my friend morgan someone that she's with on, with on the tour would eat an egg salad sandwich from 7-eleven every day because she didn't want to eat japanese food and they're like why did you come here you know so i feel like if i went to china i'd be like i hate this and you'd be like you knew you were going to hate this why did you come here you know
Well, or you learn to adapt, right? I mean, I, yeah. I hated it. The first time I had beer, I hated it. The first couple of times I had beer, I hated it. But then just like, you know, you try. Not that <laughs> traditional cultural food in China is the same as drinking beer, but still, you get my point. I remember in college, I bought a bottle of bourbon and I was like, I'm going to like this. And here <laughs> we are today. <laughs> yeah, fair point. So we figured it out. <laughs> and that's why you you have the fan. Oh, no, this, yeah. This is, a, this is a Japanese fan that I bought at 7-Eleven in Japan. Um, yeah, no, I've just been holding it at my desk because like, it gets hot. So I've been doing this. All right. That's it's, nice. Uh, cool goes with the vibes. Yeah. Um, sweet. Anything to announce before we hop off? Uh, no. But thanks, friends, for listening. We're at Doom to Fill Pod at all the socials. Send us an email um, at Doom to Fill Pod at gmail.com. Our Patreon just surpassed $50,000 a month. We can't thank you enough. Oh my god, could you fucking imagine? Stop. No, I actually can't. Stop it. Um <laughs> uh, yeah, write to us, doom to fill pod at gmail.com. Uh tell your friends, tell your family, and your yeah, that's it. Um yes, sweet. Yes. Anything else? Cool. That's it. Sweet. I'm gonna go ahead and cut us off, and we are, I don't know where the new things.